Good evening and welcome to the new theatre in Dublin for the latest event of this year's James Connolly Festival. My name is Graham Harrington, I'm an activist with the Communist Party of Ireland and I'm going to be your chair tonight. The, this evening is being co-hosted by the Pat O'Donnell Socialist Republican Forum and the event's title is Northern Ireland, Built by the Empire. Our guests tonight are Fergal McFlusky and Liz Gillis and the format for the meeting will see each guest speak for up to 15 minutes followed by some questions and discussion. A hundred years after the partition of Ireland and the creation of the Northern State by British imperialism, James Connolly's warning about a carnival of reaction if Ireland would be partitioned has come true at the expense of the Irish people, North and South. Our first speaker tonight is Fergal McVlusky. Fergal is an historian and lecturer at St Mary's University, Belfast, and writes at the blog Vlusk. So, uh, Fergal, would you like to lead the way tonight? Or a kid, me, I got a car, I guess. Um, more an honour to do so than you, the event, I guess, uh, and kind of like you forth. Um, I probably reaffirm Connolly's opinion about the carnival reaction, but I look at it from a different perspective, as, uh, from the same uh, house uh, off Hugo Street on the Falls Road, just opposite the city cemetery, almost at the same time a year previously. Connolly had analysed uh, the intersection between class and sectarianism in Belfast, and he had located this idea about an aristocracy of labour within loyalism and the manner in which what he called the master class had manipulated uh, the Protestant working class for their own interests. But Con Connolly also said, while well, no good can come from blaming them, the Protestant workers, he says, no good but only infinite evil can come from truckling to them. And uh, in essence, we're at a conjuncture in history where the constitutional and the socio-economic future of this country are up for grabs. And there's an opportunity for the Irish working class to uh, claim the ownership of Ireland and to create a new, more socially just future based on equality and based on an Irish nation in the tradition of civic nationalism and the radical enlightenment of Wolf Tone and the other Belfast Protestants who pledged to break the connection between Britain and Ireland. And the means towards this was uh, to unify Catholic Protestant in the centre, and we might add people of no religion now uh, into that mix. Now, the, the big question here then is, the idea that there's a political consensus going on at the minute, that the conflict in Ireland is essentially an ethno-religious conflict or two warring tribes uh, in the North, Protestant Catholics, immutable hostility, and Britain and the British state are some sort of neutral arbiter or referee. And I would contest that actually, if you look at the, the, the title of this uh, conversation tonight, points towards the British states and the, as an imperial state's intrinsic interest in the partition of this country and in the exploitation of Ireland across the centuries, and that Ireland as England's first colony was symptomatic and emblematic, really, of imperial policy globally. And I want to try and maybe uh, do what I can to redirect the conversation towards rediscovering the three main strands of ideology in Irish history. And those three strands go back to the time of the United Irishmen and go back to the Enlightenment. And one strand is a reactionary strand, it's a conservative strand, placed towards the Protestant supremacy and ascendancy, and that's the strand for, with, with the, the Orange Order, and Orangeism and Loyalism grows out of in 1785 with the foundation of the Orange Order. And it's very telling that the, the, those same class dynamics between you know, a big house unionism and a Protestant working class with some degree of preferential treatment to the Catholic working class were apparent in the 1790s as well. Lord Don Forley, uh, Thomas Knox of Dungannon, said despite the, their licentious character, uh, the orange men are necessary for the preservation of our lives and property. So that reactionary tendency is still here. And you just have to look at the conduct of the DUP, their championing of Trump, their Islamophobia, their homophobia, their racism. These are reactionary politics. There shouldn't be an equivalence really made between this type of reactionary right-wing politics and then two other types of politics in our history that have emerged from the Enlightenment or the use of reason in politics. One is, is a liberal type of politics who's an Irish manifestation, is a type of constitutional nationalism. And the other is obviously a radical uh, strain of the Enlightenment, which is uh, represented in Irish history through republicanism and uh, socialism. Now, the, the problem really with the liberalism of this, and this is, this is a, a problem that is current throughout the expansion of the British Empire, is that liber liberalism, whether we talk about sectarianism, whether we talk about race, deals with the oppressor on its own terms. So if you look at it in terms of uh, racism, for instance, 
It promotes what's called uplift suasion. That actually you have to you have to meet the critique of the oppressor. The op oppressor's labelling and othering of you as uncivilized and almost subhuman. You have to meet the oppressor on those terms, and that, in very many respects, is what constitutional nationalism was. You had to prove to the colonial oppressor that you were fit for self-government. You had to carve your niche out at their table. What the radical strain of the Enlightenment did, what Irish republicanism and socialism, socialism did, was it promoted a concept of universal rights and the subversion and overthrow of colonial oppression. And I think we have to try and rediscover that because that is the framework for the attraction of the best elements of the Protestant working class towards a unified working class in Ireland and towards a new Ireland based on a concept of civic nationalism, not a, a nation based on ethnicity or superiority or supremacism, but a civic nation based on universal rights in the best tradition of Wolf's Tone, the United Irishmen, the Radical Enlightenment and obviously the tradition of Irish Republican Socialism of Connolly and O'Donnell. So it's through an understanding of this really, this intersection between empire and sectarianism, and sectarianism really, as Nicholas Canney very, very uh, famously said years ago in his relations with the conquest of Ireland, sectarianism or religion as the badge of an inferior race. And if we look at the institution and the implementation of partition in Ireland, we are looking at Ireland within the context of a wider global empire and the currency of an ideology of racism. So the best example of this, I think, and the most prominent example of this was the dual subversion of two attempts at constitutional nationalism and liberalism. The first one is the Gladstonian attempt towards home rule, where Gladstone acknowledges the right of some sort that Irish people actually you know, conform to the standards of English civilization and should be given some self-government. And then the reactionary tendency within the Tory party and the British political establishment to subvert this. And Lord Salisbury, the Conservative leader, very famously says, like the Hindus and the Hottentots, and the Hottentots are black South Africans, the Irish are in inherently incapable of self-government. And the denial of Irish limited self-government and Irish self-determination subsequently is based on the same racist paradigm that operates globally and uh, is hypocritically uh, advanced by Britain, particularly after the First World War, in terms of its application of self-determination against the Austro-Hungarian and the German and the Turkish Empire, but its denial of self-determination to subject peoples within its own empire a criticism that could equally be made of France and America, by the way. So what you get then really is, and how you can understand part the partition of Ireland, the partition of Ireland is a result of a long-term context of imperialism and colonial rule, and the, ideolo the ideology of racism that is consequent of that, it takes an expression in sectarianism within Ireland, and then a crisis within the British ruling class, which is a, a an element of a wider organic crisis within la belle epoque capitalism which leads to the First World War. So the crisis within the British ruling class happens in 1909 where elements within the British ruling class attached towards liberalism try to uh, introduce democratic reforms, democratisation, social welfare, 1909 Lloyd George and the People's Budget. The most reactionary elements within the British establishment centred around the Conservative Party deny this and their new leader, or leader, Andrew Bonner Law, eh, uses the question of Ulster, just as Randolph Churchill had used it in the 1880s, as a means to subvert wider democratic and social progress within Britain itself. Bonner Law, who, who tells uh, Thomas Jones, Lloyd George's uh, cabinet secretary, that the Irish are an inferior race, accuses the Liberal government and their supporters within constitutional nationalism, John Redmond's Irish Parliamentary Party, he calls them a revolutionary committee which has seized power by fraud. He then champions Ulster Unionist resistance with other reactionaries and imperialists, most notably Edward Carson. And he says in a very telling speech at Blenheim Palace uh, in July 1912 that there are stronger things in parliamentary majorities. So the wider British imperial elite, of which the Ulster Unionist leadership were a component, use the question of partition in Ireland to subvert democracy at home. And this forms a smaller aspect of a wider approach towards the denial of freedom and equality to subject peoples across the empire. So this great champion really of, of partition, this, you know, of Ulster unionism, the Dublin born solicitor, Edward Carson. Edward Carson is a died in the wool reactionary. He votes against trade union legislation, he's against the extension of the franchise, he's against the, the, this establishment 
of the Church of England. He actually contributes a debate on the poor law in 1912 that says that poor people should be sent to labour colonies. This person is championed as some sort of liberal uh, within an awful lot of co uh, contemporary historiography, but he's a dyed in reactionary who views the empire uh, as central to his position on Ireland. And it's because of his, uh, because of the imperial connotations of Ulster's resistance to home rule, that other arch imperialists, such as Lord Milner, that, that great race patriot uh, of the kindergarten in, in South Africa, the man who oversaw the concentration camps where over 30,000 Boers were, were killed, Lord Milner attaches himself, comes out of political retirement, and attaches himself to Ulster Unionist resistance because of the implications of empire. Lord Miller writes a letter to Carsten. He says, I know this is no mere trifle. This goes beyond politics. And it's Milner and Walter Long, who used to be the leader of the Irish Unionists and will eventually be the person who proposes partition, who form the, the Union Defence League, which is a British and imperial equivalent of the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant of September 1912. And it, it says that its mission is to save the white settler colony of Ulster from submersion in a sea of inferior Celts. That is the basis of their support for Ulster Unionist resistance. So what Ulster Unionist resistance does, it denies parliamentary sovereignty, it destroys the constitutional game, this uplift suasion, this idea that John Redmond, you know, we can carve our niche out at the table, an empire of equals. It rubbishes this, okay, it, and then it brings the gun back into Irish politics. In January 1913, the UVF is formed. By April 1914, the UVF import guns, which they bought from the Kaiser, uh, through Fred Crawford, that inveterate racist and loyalist and uh, future pogromist, uh, they bring 35,000 rifles into Ireland. The Unionists bring the gun back into Irish politics. Redmond's decision then to support Britain in the First World War, to go wherever the firing line extends, then destroys the basis of constitutional nationalism. The constitutional nationalism from the time of Daniel O'Connell onwards had said that there was a dichotomy, a polarity between moral force you still hear this crack from people in Fianna Fáil and the SDLP and physical force nationalism. John Redmond tells Irish people to go out, 35,000 of them die, and a lot of Irish people say, well, what's the difference between dying for the British Empire and the continent and fighting for freedom in Ireland? So it ruptures, it completely destroys constitutional nationalism as a viable form of political expression. And within the organic crisis, the global crisis of the First World War, the Irish people then, after the, the sort of the galvanic event of Easter 1916, then strike out for their own self-determination. Now, everybody knows, and I'll go over the story of the December 1980 general election, Sinn Féin won 73 out of 105 seats. There's a clear mandate for an Irish Republic to set up Dáil Éireann, Dáil Éireann but the, the, and the title of the, the night's discussion is imperialism. Well, the key point about this is that uh, Lloyd George admits during the passage of the Government of Ireland Act of December 1920, that the majority of people in Ireland want a republic. In January and June 1920, they re the Irish people reaffirm, over 70% of them reaffirm, by voting for the Labour Party or Sinn Féin, reaffirm their commitment to an Irish republic. Like George says in the House of Commons, the, if we were to grant self-determination to Ireland, we would give them a republic, but we're not going to do that. Edward Carson, during the same debate, says when Woodrow Wilson talks about making the world safe for democracy, he's really making the world safe for hypocrisy. That's a quote from his speech in the House of Commons. This ridiculous idea that the constitutional settlement that currently exists in Ireland, the partition of Ireland, is based on dual rights to self-determination, is an actual inversion of the historical record and the reality. The island of Ireland was partitioned to subvert the self-determination of the Irish people because if you read the speeches in Parliament and the private letters of leading Tories and Unionists, they didn't believe the Irish people were entitled to self-determination. Walter Long eh, called the IRN Sinn Féin vile criminals who must be exterminated. And Carson said he was going to make the world safe for hypocrisy. Carson said of the Irish, he called them Celts, the Celts have done nothing in Ireland but create trouble and disorder. Irish men who have turned out successful are not, as far as I know, of Celtic origin. This inveterate racism was at the basis of it. If you read Lord Londonderry, Lord Londonderry, that very famous moderate of the, the Northern Ireland government who went on to uh, set up the British Union of Fascists and drink tea in Berkish Garden with a good friend Hitler, he was the most moderate member of Craig's cabinet, 
Uh, he writes that the whole intention of partition is to destroy the concept of Ireland as a nation. There are innumerable unionist politicians in their private correspondence make the same point. We are accepting partition to destroy Ireland as a nation as a concept. We are accepting partition. We're playing the game of talking the language of self-determination cynically in order to defeat self-determination. So that forms the basis really then of the rejection of Irish self-determination and the institution of partition. And the reason why an imperial elite, which includes all the Ulster units, do this is because they recognise the implications for, of a successful struggle for Irish self-determination for the future of the British Empire. At the same time that the Irish are struggling for their freedom, the Egyptian people launch an uprising. Okay? The Amritsar ma massacre happens in uh, India. Edward Charson is one of the biggest, gives the biggest public contribution to General Dyer's defence. So, and again, this is back to this idea about the radical enlightenment. The constitutional nationalists, a liberal position, wants to try and you know, reach the levels of the imperial master. The radical enlightenment, the radical republican and socialist tradition, wants to subvert empire and has solidarity and is based on universal concepts of rights and equality. So, this is the framework on which the Ulster Unionists and the British state then institute partition. But partition isn't a piece of parchment. It's not the Government of Ireland Act of December 1920. Partition is implemented through massive physical violence. It's implemented through a pogrom. After the Unionist leadership secure the, the, the acceptance of six-county partition in March 1920 and then at a subsequent vote because of internal dissent in May 1920 at the Ulster Unionist Council, they then, with the help of the British state, institute a bit of internal house housekeeping. And what internal housekeeping is really about, and Liz will talk about this in more detail, is the expulsion of up to 10,000 Catholics and what are called rotten frauds or uh, Protestant socialists and trade unionists from the main shipbuilding and engineering plants in Belfast. So the violence begins in, in, in Derry uh, on the 19th of June. The UVF are involved, the British Army helped them, and I'm sure Liz is going to talk about this. But the key event here really are, are the expulsions of the 24th of July 1920. And we'll talk about this probably more in terms of the questions. But what happens, and this is because, now some people say the Belfast Labour Party, which, who were anti-partitionist, uh, trade unionists and socialists, uh, gained 13 seats. I think we can definitely say that 12 of those councillors are anti-partitions. Right? So the, the opposition party during the January 1920 elections in Belfast City Hall, that great citadel of unionism, right? they are anti-partitionists and they gain most of their votes from unskilled Protestant working class people. Sam Kyle tops the poll in the Shankill Ward in a proportional representation election. Dawson Gordon, another man who mobilised the millies or the, or the mill workers, he's elected on his transfers. So the, the opposition to unionism in Belfast politically doesn't come from the, the Constitutional National Party. They get six seats. Sinn Féin gets six seats. The opposition is from a trade union-based anti-partitionist party that is attracting sizable support from the Protestant working class, from a nascent organisation that suggests that, surprise, surprise, when somebody's socioeconomic interests conform to an ideology rather than unionism, then they are prepared to move away from their unionism. That unionism and loyalism are not immutable concepts written in historical stone. That things change. Just the way that, that 100 years previously, a lot of uh, Belfast Protestants were attracted to republicanism. Now, uh, what happens is, is that, uh, and there, there's good documentary evidence for this in the archives of the Ulster Unionist Labour Association, the Ulster Unionist Labour Association, I should say, by the way, which is based on the inspiration of the, the British Workers' League, which is a proto-fascist organisation set up by Lord Milner in Britain. And Edward Carson is the vice chairman, and Milner and Carson are like that. And Carson looks at this and sees it as a prototype for a mass-based type of loyalist politics, conservative politics, reactionary politics in the new democratic age, i.e. it conforms to an awful lot of the constituency, constituent elements of what will become European fascism. Now, the Ulster Unionist Labour Association is a bit of a strange titan because the chairman was actually a mill owner. Yeah? J.M. Andrews, the future uh, Prime Minister of the North during the Second World War. And the person who controlled it was Richard Dawson Bates, the Secretary of the Ulster Unionist 
Council and future Minister of Northern Affairs, uh, or of Home, Northern uh, Minister of Home Affairs. Now, the records of this organisation indicate that they organise the meeting at Workmans and Clarks, and that it has been planned in advance that they will purge the engineering works and the shipyards of Catholics and rotten prods. And this is because they want to create the economic basis of the orange statelet which will be built after the institutional partition. If you want to feed your family, if you want to survive, you have to tip your hat to loyalism. And this was all achieved and implemented through the expulsion of up to 10,000 workers uh, in Belfast. And the Westminster Gazette, I just quote from it, says on the, uh, the 7th in July uh, 1920, said, it is common knowledge in Belfast and frequently admitted by individual unionists that plans were matured at least two months ago to drive all home rule workmen from the shipyards. Okay? Now, what is what this, so Edward Carson meets the Ulster Unionist Labour Association beforehand. He then gives an, an incendiary speech at the Orange Field in Finney. He says, I hate words without action. These men who come forward as the friends of Labour care no more about Labour than does the man on the moon. Well, you know, he's only back from Bay Ritz. He right. was on his holiday, so he seemed to be a good friend of Labour, Edward Carson. But what does Carson say in the House of Commons after these expulsions? He says, the, the shipyard workers of Belfast are my greatest friends in the world. James Craig, who will be the first Northern Prime Minister, presents them with a flag in October 1920, and he says, do I agree with what you boys have done? I say yes. And this is, this is not Nash's propaganda. This is recorded in Lady Craig's diary. The fingerprints of the pogrom, the, the unionist leader, leadership have their fingerprints all over the pogrom. And the rationale is quite clear. You control the economic basis of life in the north, you control the north, you discipline the Protestant working class, you exclude the Catholic working class, and you lay the foundation for your discriminatory statement. So what is the afterlife of the statement? It's quite clear. Uh, the subsequent elections in May 1921, for you know, we we're, were going to be celebrating this soon enough. Okay, uh, the subsequent elections are marked by mass intimidation. Mass intimidation from whom? Between July and August 1920, 10,000 people are driven out of their work. Right? 300 Catholic families are driven out of Lisbon, and what probably constitutes ethnic cleansing, a similar thing that, that happens in both Tremor and Bambridge in July. Okay. And what is the British state's response to this? They take the pogromists and turn them into the Ulster Special Constabulary. And the decision to do this is taken in September 1920. And this isn't, you know, a secret. The leaders of the UVF and throne, Ricardo, McClintock and uh, Stevenson, write a secret memo to members of the UVF and say, yes, by the way, the Ulster Special Constabulary is the UVF and we're not going to recruit any Catholics. So you control the labour market, you have to be a loyalist, you have to sign a declaration of loyalty to get a job in the main industrial areas of Belfast. And then the British government supplements your, the income of Protestant workers during a, a, a post-war economic downturn which kicks in in the summer of 1920 through, through £6 million for the upkeep of the Ulster Special Constabulary. You create the orange economy and this is what they did. So these specials, the, the, remember the, the, these Labour councillors, tw 12 Labour councillors, when the Labour stands in the, in the elections to the Northern Parliament in May 1921, they booked the Ulster Hall. And shipyard workers come down, seize the building and almost kill the four uh, Labour candidates. And they send a, a telegram to James Craig. You know James Craig, that great Democrat. And they say, we've seized the Ulster Hall, will you come down and address us? And he sends them a telegram back and he says, no, I can't, I, I, I'm too busy, but I am with them in spirit. No, they will do their duty, as will I. Well done, big and wee yards. I.e., well done for intimidating the political opposition and seizing control of their, uh, their election meeting. And uh, Jimmy Bird, who, who is a, a, a fine socialist and was in the Boilermakers Union and was expelled and he became the spokesman for the expelled workers, he says that there was widespread intimidation and there was widespread personation in this election. So essentially... The results of the first election instalment were based on force majeure from the Ulster Special Constabulary, which had been set up by the British state. At the end of May 1922, the following year, the state is a year old, Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, says that 
the Ulster Special Constabulary are an exact analogy for Mussolini's fascisti. He says that the violence was started by Ulster Protestants. Most of the victims are Belfast Catholics, while we have armed 48,000 Protestants. Now, for anyone to try and portray the British imperial state as a neutral arbiter or referee in this process is just patently ridiculous. Right? Now, the nature of this polity, the nature of this regime, becomes apparent when we look at the manner in which it doesn't have any economic power. Yeah? It just has physical, political power and violence. In 1924, there, were, there was one policeman to 699 people in England and Wales. Right? In the same year, there was one policeman to 751 people in Scotland right? in 1924. There's been no violence in the North since the start of the Civil War in the South. In fact, Churchill writes to James Craig, you can be nice and uh, relaxed now that Collins has drawn the sword against the enemies of the British Empire. Yeah? So there's no violence in the North. Right? There's one policeman in the North to every 160 people. And their attention is not directed at two-thirds of the population, it's directed at one-third of the population. And the, the apparatus for the suppression and oppression of this third of the population comes in at the same time, in May 1922, as Lloyd George makes his great speech to the cabinet about fascisti. It's called the Special Powers Act. And Balthazar Voster, the, the, the Minister of Home Affairs in the apartheid regime in South Africa, famously said he would give up all the coercive and racist legislation in South Africa for one clause of the Special Powers Act. And internment is used against the national population in every decade from the foundation of the state right up until the 1970s. Now, I'll finish, because I know we're, we're, we're tight for time, but I'll finish by, by reaffirming, really, that what Connolly said, well, no good can come from blaming these poor, disadvantaged teenagers who are out throwing petrol bombs at buses and peace lines, right? The reason, the reason for, for a lot, for lot of their antagonism and their anger is that their virtual abandonment by their political representatives, by the ghettoization, by the increase in poverty, there's no peace dividend for the Catholic working class. There's no peace dividend for the Protestant working class. There's a, a doubling of suicide. There's 35,000 people using food banks. There's 10,000 people homeless or uh, without uh, a permanent address in the north. And one in four children are living in poverty. Okay? But the ideology, the idea that you have to truckle to the ideology of loyalism is patently ridiculous. You're not going to base any sort of socially just and progressive country on... on you know, come and do an accommodation with reactionaries. And how reactionary they were uh, will, will, will come from a, a couple of pieces of evidence and then I, I promise I'll finish. The first one is actually, there are two internal reports. There's an, an internal report by uh, an organisation that calls itself the Northern Army, but, but it was called the Free State Army where I was from. And, and uh, they, they say that uh, members of the, the Ulster Special Constabulary have set up their own bra branches of the Ku Klux Klan. And this is repeated in April 1924 in an internal IRA report, the anti treaty IRA report, who say that members of the officer class, the Ulster Special Constabulary, have set up branches of the Ku Klux Klan, and I really love their name, under the name the Gay Crusaders. Yeah. Probably didn't have the, the, the same sort of uh, implications as it does today. But anyway, the newsletter, the Belfast newsletter, carry an article on the 4th of January 1923 about fascism in Italy and the Ku Klux Klan in America. And they say, of course, while we, we don't have a black shirt or a white hood, they have an orange sash, and we rely on democracy, they could rely on democracy because they, they carved out, essentially, an artificial border to make sure that they would have a majority in perpetuity, although in perpetuity doesn't mean what it used to. Uh, the, the newsletter said that, talking about Italian fascists and the Ku Klux Klan, it would be absurd to underestimate the significance of such movements or to ignore what is noble in their intentions. Their strength springs from their genuine desire to make life sweeter and more wholesome. So by 1934, and I'll finish on this, and we have to try and understand that this sort of aggressive reactionary loyalism is used as a break on social progress and movements towards unity between Catholic and Protestant workers. So as a result of the Great Depression, obviously, and the outdoor relief strikes, you get 
phenomenal scenes of, of Catholic and Protestant workers working class out rioting in the streets together and protesting together. And it's within that context that you get the very, very famous derogatory statements by unionist politicians such as Basil Brick, you know, don't have a opinion about the place. And it's in 1934 that James Craig said that the Orange Order and the Black Brotherhood or the B Specials could substitute as fascists. And the big point here, and he said that publicly, the big point here is that this lazy equivalence between, you know, this is an ethno-religious conflict, two warring tribes that will never change, and the British government or the British state are some sort of neutral arbiter and we have no art nor part in it, flies completely in the face of the fact that the British state and the British statesman who implemented partition worked hand in glove with an Ulster Unionist leadership who were part of their own political party, part of their own ascendancy class, and who shared the same concepts of racist imperialism as the Unionists did, as the Ulster Loyalists did. And that until we accept this, and until we present a vision, a vision that came from Belfast in very many respects, of a civic nation based on the traditions of the radical enlightenment in Ireland, then we might lose this great epoch-defining opportunity to you know, overturn the constitutional settlement and set up Connolly's Workers' Republic. Uh, Arouse a fard a fard a lot of uh, points to reflect on there. It kind of takes me back to Roger Coupling's uh, infamous poem, uh, "The White Man's Burden," where he talks about uh, how it's the role of the so-called advanced races to come together and sort of separate out the savages, which is uh, ironic considering that the divisions among uh, the peoples of the world were created by imperialism in the first place. Um, it kind of shows how the north of Ireland uh, has always been and is uh, a colony. It isn't uh, some type of neutral uh, state where uh, the divisions between communities uh, can be reconciled. Um, partition itself is, in many ways you could say, a linchpin of counter-revolution in Ireland that followed on from the revolutionary struggle that you had with the formation of the, the Soviets and workplace occupations and uh, community struggles, as well as obviously the, the, the military struggle. Um, there's a, that's sort of a general overview, um, but obviously we can't, I suppose to quote Connolly, uh, Ireland as distinct from our people means nothing. Uh, so we do need to look uh, away from the uh, ruling class interpretation of partition and begin to look at how it affected people's lives and so on. So uh, Liz, this is sort of your area of expertise. So uh, would you like to start us off with your presentation and, and so on? Yes, yeah, so um, if you look at 1920, uh, just as, as a year and explain what was happening right across the country, because events that happened in one part of the country had direct implications for other parts of the country and that certainly can be seen um, in terms of Ulster. Um, but in 1920 we were entering the, the second year of the War of Independence and things really were heating up um, on, on both sides of the conflict. But it starts off with the local elections um, in January, as Fergal mentioned, followed by more local elections in June. And Sinn Féin did carry on the success of the 1918 general election. Um, the British really didn't want them to do that. And they actually introduced a system of proportional representation with those elections. Now, they had introduced it in Sligo as a, as a sort of a, a tester um, in a by-election earlier on. But the British government thought that the Irish could not understand the concept of PR, that it was so confusing that that would then completely undermine um, the rise of Sinn Féin, completely backfired on Sinn Féin because Sinn Féin educated the people on how PR actually worked. Um, and it is interesting to note that one of the first things the, the Northern Ireland state does when it gets the chance is to remove PR because it is, I suppose, a fairer way of representation for the people. So that backfired on the British. And in those elections, Sinn Féin dominate the, the local councils. That's where you've got real power, real government who controls the local government. 
And the tensions really begin to increase in Ulster from that moment on because the unionists begin to see that their power base is being threatened. And if we look at Derry, uh, Fergal mentioned Derry, they elected a Catholic Lord Mayor. And one of the things he does, so, so that's already in, increasing uh, the, the fear and the tension in Derry. But he then removes um, Lord French, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, from uh, the, the list of freemen of the city. So that's another, you know, threat. So it, it culminates then in June um, 1920, where the violence just erupts and you have a number of people killed. It's centred around uh, the Diamond area. Um, the IRA uh, do defend their areas. And you have Padder Clancy and Dick McKee, who were the commandant and vice commandant of the Dublin Brigade of the IRA, sent up to Derry to see what was going on and, and try to help. Um, they, the British military did step in. Um, it is said because the, the, they did so because the IRA were getting the upper hand, so they step in and they, they end the violence. But that unfortunately wasn't the end of the violence in Ulster. Um, and and it, it just going back to the point that I said at the start, events that happen in one part of the country have a, an effect on other parts. And unfortunately, from um, March right through, it has a terrible effect um, on the lives of Catholics and nationalists in all across Ulster, but especially in Lisbon, uh, Banbridge, and of course, Belfast. And to explain why that happens, so in March, March is a turning point um, in 1920 because you have the arrival of the Black and Tans. So that force that was raised to basically bolster the, the uh, numbers of the RIC because they were the primary targets of the IRA. Uh, they were resigning in droves. You couldn't get people to, to join the RIC. So Churchill raises this force, uh, the Black and Tans. And they're sent over. They were followed in July by the auxiliary cadets. Um, two different forces. One was a temporary force, the auxiliaries, um, and the, the, or the black and tans were a, a permanent force. They were to be the police. For as long as British were here, they were the police force. Um, on the 20th of March, now it's just slightly before the black and tans arrive, but in Cork, you have Tomás McCourton, who was the OC of the Cork Number no. 1 Brigade of the IRA. So in those elections in January, he, like many other members of Sinn Féin, was elected a Lord Mayor. But this is not only a man as the public face of Republicanism being the Lord Mayor, he was also a, a militant Republican because he was the OC of Cork Number no. 1. An RAC man, Morta, was shot by the IRA on the 19th of March. Now, McCourton spoke out against this. Um, he didn't agree with the way that that policy um, of the assassination is being carried out. He actually comforted, sent condolences to the family of Morta. The 20th of March, McCourton's birthday, knock comes to the door, men with blackened faces, they arrive, they call for McCourton, his heavily pregnant wife answers the door, and he was shot dead in front of her. Um, she herself lost her twin babies. Now, at the inquest that followed, and this then feeds into why uh, inquest, public inquests weren't held, um, the jury actually found a verdict of willful murder um, against uh, the, the, the authorities, but they named Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, amongst others, and he na named a, a man D.I. Swansea. Now, he was a district inspe inspector. They get him out of Cork. He's sent up to Lisbon. He thinks he's safe. He's not. The IRA by their time. Now, what you have then setting in is this attitude from the authorities, the Crown Forces, that they're getting the upper hand on the IRA because they've raised these forces. And there are IRA men being arrested and so on. They are having successes. Um, and you have a speech, and some of you may, may have heard of this, um, the Lestelle mutiny, where a number of RAC men in Kerry mutiny, there was a mutiny, they resigned from the police force because. Bryce Corn Lieutenant Colonel Bryce Ferguson Smith. Um, he made this speech to these policemen basically saying, we're going to um, play the Sinn Féiners at their own game. Um, and basically, if someone comes towards you with their hands in their pockets, if they don't take their hands out of their pockets in enough time, shoot them. If you make mistakes, so what? You, nothing will happen to you. We're going to get them and we're out to get them. And we've raised this force. Thousands are coming over uh, to Ireland. 
and that then puts him in the sights of the IRA and he was shot by the Cork IRA um, in July 1920. Now, this happens on the 17th of July. So Bryce Ferguson Smith is shot. Five days before that, you had the, the famous speech uh, made by Edward Carson for the 12th of July celebrations, where he s uses what is happening around the country, and especially with the elections that have happened. Um, and he sees that the British government are, are, are unwilling to do anything to help the, the, the unionists in the north. And what he says um, in his speech, 2000s basically, is that if you, the British government aren't going to do something, we're going to do something about it. We are going to defend ourselves. So you can see that six months detention has been building and then it comes to a crescendo um, in July. So what you have in newspapers following the 12th of July, you have people writing in to the newspapers, unionists, and they sign it, loyal unionists. Um, so I can't recall seeing ones actually signed personally, um, but you have this loyal unionist, and yes, we are going to use violence, we are going to do what we can. Um, if the British government isn't going to protect us and step in, well, we're going to do it ourselves. And you see that it just keeps building, building, building. And so it's, it's a powder keg ready to go off. And then you have Ferguson Smith being shot, on the 21st of July, his body is brought back to Banbridge. Now, you had this whole issue because the railway men refused to transport his body um, by train. And so that is causes a scene. And then his body is brought back to his native Banbridge and Banbridge just goes up. But this then culminates or ties in with the return to work um, of the, 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 the people from the holiday of the 12th of July um, and just sort of when you when you connect that with what Fergal was saying earlier that you have the speeches being made you have it's like the, the, the leadership are waiting for a moment to, to unleash this this level of violence and that spark that unleashes that is Bryce Ferguson Smith being shot down in Cork so as uh, Fergal mentioned you have the the expulsions and, and again, horrific violence, not just being levied at the Catholics, but also the, the rotten prods. Um, and the descriptions, again, the newspapers, just people having to jump into the river lagging, that they're trying to get away. And then when they swim across the other side, there's gangs waiting for them on the other side. And then it very quickly spreads to the, the local communities. Um, and Bally McGarrett comes in for particular um, attention from the, 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 the mobs, the, the loyalist mobs. Um, St. Matthew's Church really comes under their, their, their focus. And the IRA do try and defend the areas, but see the IRA in Ulster, it, 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 it was different up there because they were outnumbered, they were outgunned. And the position of the IRA in Ulster was to be defensive rather than offensive. And you have younger members of the IRA basically saying to the leadership, they're seeing this violence happening around them. They're seeing people being shot. They're trying to defend their communities. And the, the hierarchy, the, the GHQ, the, the commanding officers, won't let them take the offensive. So then you see tension sort of fermenting between within the ranks of the IRA. Um, but they do defend. And like previously in Derry, the military do step in, um, but not before, you know, um, a number of people had been killed. As Fergus said, thousands had been expelled from their workplaces and then hundreds of homes had been burnt. And then Catholic businesses were deliberately targeted, specifically spirit grocers. And that violence was bad enough, but it doesn't end. Because then again, events that have a connection to what happens in the southern part of Ireland has a direct connection to, to what happens um, in the likes of Lisbon and Belfast. And then we have D.I. Swansea. So remember, D.I. Swansea was the one that was mentioned, that was named um, in the, the inquest of the shooting of Tomás McCourton, got out of Cork, sent up to Lisbon, but the IRA were always going to get him. So we have members of the Cork IRA, uh, they make their way to Lisbon, where he was. Um, they were helped by local Belfast IRA men. They waited outside the church on the Sunday morning in, on the 22nd of August. And as the I Swans, the Oswald Swans was coming out of the church, they shoot him. Now, if to, to, you, know, you cannot say that this was not as a result of Tomás McCourton's killing in March. And to hammer a home 
the first shots came from Tomas McCourton's gun. So this is directly to do with his shooting, his killing, his murder in March. And then it all kicks off again. Lisburn goes up. Um, again, the Catholic families um, are expelled from homes. Their, 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 their businesses are set on fire. And again, the newspapers, they're great for giving the various accounts and the different accounts, depending on what newspaper you're reading. Um, the, the, the loyalist unionist newspapers always tend to put, although it's loyalist violence, um, there is, uh, it's because of Sinn Féin. Um, and if, if, you know, potentially a, a, a Protestant person is killed, it was a Sinn Féin bully, even if it's in a Protestant area, as, or as they're firing into, it's Protestants that are firing into the area and not uh, Republicans. But it, there is also a... a, a, a there's a tragedy in reading the newspaper accounts as well as the way it's reported. And it's the way you can see class being brought into it. And one example I'll give you. So it was in York Street and this is the August violence. So where it had quietened down um, after the initial violence in July and then it kicks off again at the end of August. And you have this young boy, Robert McAlpin. And York Street was, was another uh, centre of inc just horrific violence, workers that were attacked in trams going to work and so on by the Catholics. Um, and it's just that tit for tat killing. But this 11 year old boy, um, trying to do his civic duty, he saw the local spirit grocers being looted by a crowd of, of people. You know, it happened in 1916, people take their opportunities. Um, and there was a reverend there. And Robert was, was shot while trying to protect um, the, this shop. And the way the newspaper reported it, I think it was from the Belfast newsletter, the, the, the headline is, clergyman's narrow escape. And it talks about this reverend, how he's there on York Street and how he's there, you know, telling the people to stop and then blah, 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 blah. Uh, a bullet whizzes past, a clergyman had a narrow escape. Oh yeah, by the way, 11 year old Robert McAlpin was killed. Why isn't his name the first thing that you see in that paragraph? Why is a reverend seeing the fact that he had a narrow escape more important than an 11 year old child being killed. Um, doesn't matter whether they were Catholic, Protestant, that should take precedence in that, that article, but it didn't. The clergyman was all right, but the child died, let's move on. Sorry, that's just one thing that just really gets me going. Um, and the violence, it did continue um, until the, until, now Fergal probably correct me on this, but um, it did continue into September. Am I right, Fergal, in saying that? Um, but what you have at the end of the period, so from July to December 1920, just to give the, the, the figures, and I do have them here, roughly. So between July and December 1920, approximately 78 people were killed, up to 10,000 workers expelled, and unfortunately, the majority of them never got their jobs back. Um, approximately 650 homes burnt, and of course the B specials were set up. And when we look at all of the situation that was happening in Ireland, and the British government trying to solve the Irish question as they call it, I suppose the partition presents itself nicely as a way to deal with the Ulster question first, get that sorted, and then let's deal with the Irish question. And I'm just going to read out a quote here from uh, Hammer Greenwood. And now it's a bit long, but I think it's just worth, worth reading it. Um, and this is from a newspaper on the 30th of December. So the Government of Ireland Act had been passed. And when asked about what they thought, the, the, the politicians, the British politicians thought of this act, the passing of it, Hammer Greenwood said, Ireland has now been granted a measure of self-government, which when it is developed to the full extent uh, contemplated in the act, will place her in effective control of her own national life. Yet this measure has been described as worse than useless and neither in Ireland nor in Great Britain has it been recognised as a tremendous step forward in the history of the Irish question. The Ulster question has ceased to exist. 
Unity within Ireland is left to Irishmen themselves to achieve through their own elected representatives in their own parliaments. The Act is the pledge of Britain's goodwill to Ireland and it is the best answer to those who are playing into the hands of terrorists in Ireland by suggesting that the nation is not behind the government in this matter. And this is the, the key bit. Whatever may be the development of the future, I believe that the political historian will point to this new act as the beginning of the end to the Irish question. I, for one, beg to differ. Uh, thanks uh, a million, Liz, for that uh, presentation. I was happy to see uh, all the references to Cork. And, uh, um, <laughs> But uh, I suppose we'll move on now to sort of the, the more discussion uh, aspect of our uh, event tonight. Uh, Fergal, sort of going back to you, uh, how would you see, one of the things you talk about is uh, the uni unity of uh, both the British ruling class and uh, the Irish Unionists. Um, to what degree was partition decided in uh, the corridors of power in London and Westminster? Uh, how and why did the ruling class back partition? Why did they implement it? Well, the, the British ruling class uh, had a history of partitioning colonies. So Lord Curzon, who was an Irish landlord who never spent a day in Ireland, uh, partitioned Bengal in 1805 and get a great Philip, the, the Indian National Liberation Movement, and, and turned an awful lot of members of the Indian National Congress who had been like John Redmond and Daniel O'Connell, sort of whatever the Indian version of a shawning is, and the people who wanted genuine independence or, or greater self rule. But the, the idea behind it is, is and it's, it's, always, it's always been driven by Whitehall and by the Imperial State. The, the, the idea that uh, the people in, the, the Harmar Grimm is very famous quote about the Government of Ireland Act, is this is an act that no one asked for or wanted. So the, the unionists actually, it's, the, the, it's like Hegel's cunning of reason. The unionists are the only people in this entire situation who gain home rule. So the unionists like raise an army of, of 70,000 people with 35,000 rifles because home rule is home rule, but then end up accepting their own version of home rule. It's incredible. But the, the, the logic behind it, and, and uh, if you read Bonner Law's public speeches and his letters, you read Lloyd George's letters, and you, re you read Lloyd George's interaction with Carson in particular, the idea is to subvert Ireland and the nation. This idea that you know, there's dual rights of self-determination in Ireland is a fallacy. In fact, the, the, the unionist adoption of self-determination is a device in order to subvert self-determination for the island, because there's a recognition amongst the imperial elite that if Ireland gains self-determination, then Egypt will gain it, then India will, and, and, and the emperor will disintegrate. Henry Wilson writes in, in 1920, uh, in, in his diary, he says, Ireland goes first and then after the empire. Now, the, the, the device to stop this is the partition of Ireland. Because the partition of Ireland will essentially, will, you know, we talk about Connolly and the, car the carnival of reaction, but the partition of Ireland subverts self-determination, it leaves the 26 counties of virtual possession and then it institutionalizes a form of early 20th century high imperial racism really within the fabric of the six counties. Now one of the big ironies about this is by the time the 1960s come along, the troubles come along, the, the, you know, the, the, the liberal Brit you know, British establishment turn around and they're horrified by these atavistic orange men who are all bigots and racists and you're going, well actually, <laughs> you have actually institutionalized and cemented this mentality into the structures of this you know, Frankenstein monster you've created in the six counties. And if you look uh, across the, the degree, that the person who's responsible, Curzon actually chairs a committee in 1917. And the, the, the idea of, of, of uh, poor Thomas Augur Roberts is blamed for introducing partition into the, the Commons with his amendment in, in 1912. And by, by the way, a week after the amendment, there's another pogrom in the shipyards and several thousand Catholics and Rotten Project kicked out in 1912. That's, that's, that's the, sort of like the, the, the training session for what happens in 1920. And that's just before the covenant. But the, the idea of partition is a device cooked up within the British political establishment, first of all to subvert home rule and then to subvert self-determination. So Carson accepts partition as a settlement after Lord, Lord Lorburn, who's, who's uh, the, the chairman of the Liberals' uh, Home Rule Committee, who writes a letter. And, and Carson replies to it thinking it's a, it's a signal from Osquith, but it's not. And he demands the six counties of the plantation. 
Now, not only is that historically incorrect, because obviously Antrim and, and Down weren't in the, uh, the original plantation, but he calls this his irreducible minimum. And Lord Milner, that great race patriot we talked about earlier on, the Ulster Defence League, White Settler Colony, he writes during the Buckingham Palace Conference, he says, counties, are, counties aren't important, he says, as long as it's one whole block. If it's one whole block, then you subvert the entire process. If you partition the country, th then th th these uh, Celts, these inferior Celts, can't gain any national autonomy or freedom. And this, through the entire course of the debate about partition, is the internal logic that finds no public expression. Of course the British aren't going to come out and say, you know, we, we, <laughs> we, we are completely unreasonable imperial oppressors. They, they try and give it a rationale. And the rationale essentially publicly is that, well, if, the, if, if Irish Celts are entitled to self-determination, then Ulster Unionists are entitled to self-determination. But Joseph Fisher, who's actually the unofficial union representative in the Boundary Commission that ends in failure in 1925, says that we don't actually believe this. He writes in a letter to, to Hugh de Fallon Board Montgomery, we don't believe this. And in the past, it was, you know, it was used as a device and argument. He calls it a, a reductio ad absurdum. You know, when you weren't left for any other device to argue, you used, you know, we're entitled to our own self-determination. Now, the person, who, Curzon's committee in 1917 proposed six county partition on a 55% majority to go into the south. That's with the express purpose. And he writes it in the, par in the parliamentary minutes of getting thrown in Fermanagh into the six counties. And then Walter Long takes this up uh, in 1920 and his committee. Now, by the way, James Craig's his parliamentary secretary. Right? James Craig's in the government. And James Craig tells Walter Long, Listen, we don't want nine counties because we can't control nine counties. And Walter Long writes a letter to Lloyd George, and it makes it very. And this is a quote. He says they don't want nine counties because the orange men will lose their supremacy, and he uses the word supremacy. So, where the scope for functioning democracy and self determination rests in any of this process is beyond me. But the 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 the, the very clear implication is this is that you defeat the concept of Ireland and nation. And in all their letters and all their correspondence, they say, there's no such thing as Ireland and nation. And we are employing partition deliberately to break this idea and to subvert the idea of Ireland and nation. So then, you know, all this, this uh, verbiage about self you know, the, self the, the freedom of small nations and, and self-determination, this is something that the British Empire, the French Empire, and we'll be very honest, the American Empire through the Monroe Doctrine, apply against the great powers who lose the war. But the British and the French empires expand as a result of the First World War. So this is an imperial device by an empire which is in decline, but we are still living with the historical ramifications of what was an unjust settlement 100 years ago, which was you know, established at a very immediate level for the Conservative Party to gain power again, and you get Carson's very famous speech, but at a more fundamental level as a device to protect the British Empire. And that's how you understand uh, that the partition of Ireland isn't, you know, some sort of internal settlement. You know, John Hume's very famous strand one in, internal settlement between, you know, two ethno-religious groupings that, you know, we can never change. It's actually uh, because of the exigencies of the, the, the you know, the, the greatest empire of its age. It's like, uh, you know, the, the sun never set on the British Empire because God couldn't trust the Brits in the dark. That was, you know, there you go. Um, I'd say you couldn't trust them in the light either. No. Um, That's the British ruling class, not the British ruling class. <laughs> <laughs> very clear about And uh, Liz, what was the reaction of Irish Unionists? I'm always very deliberate using the phrase uh, Irish Unionists. Uh, I think that's certainly how uh, the British see them, if you look at how often the British uh, betray their... Um, co-religionists in the, in, in the north of Ireland, it's very obvious that the way they look at it is that they're all paddies, aren't they? You know, uh, to be uh, facetious, but was there a split between, uh, say, the more Dublin and uh, 26 county based unionists and unionists in the north, or were things a bit more unified? Like, how did uh, Protestants living in the south of Ireland assimilate into the new free state? Well, there was splits bef within unionism before. This, I suppose, this really, um, 1920 really brought it to the fore because you do have the reality that, you know, the, the 
Southern Unionists are going to be, you know, left here and then isolated in the six counties is the, the Ulster uh, Unionists. Um, and the Southern Unionists, like, um, and big businessmen, I, I, I might add, like, so, you know, big, big industrial families down here, uh, Guinness, or sorry, Lord, Lord Ivy and um, Jemison and so on, all of those um, powerful, you know, industries, um, they were all Southern Unionists. And they knew that they would be affected by this. They didn't want a, 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 a partitioned Ireland. Um, and who is who is really, and I suppose who you have to, if you can feel sorry for, for unionists at this stage, um, is the unionists in Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan. Because they were hung out dry by their own counterparts. Um, and it was admitted, you know, that, you know, well, should really the whole lot of us suffer be, you know, for the sake of three counties. Well, let those three counties go and, and you know, let them fend for themselves. So you have those various splits, um, and I suppose between the Southern Unionists and the Ulster Unionists, one thing, but then to have one, like three counties in the original nine county province being basically told, okay, you're getting sacrificed for our six county fiefdom, you know, where we will have this power base. Um, that must have been a right kick in the, in the, in the, I won't say the expletive. You know what, um, you know what, I, what I mean. Um, but look, you know, in terms of industry down here, those unionists, Southern unionists, you know, uh, Lord Ivy and all continue to thrive. And they became part of the establishment, as all, you know, wealthier classes do, um, as it turned out. <laughs> the, the, the free stay was that, that was created it was only the accents that changed. Nothing else changed, because whether you're a working class and whether you're a Catholic or Protestant, really didn't matter. And if you're a woman, well, tough luck. So, you know, the, the, the wealthy and the, 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 the higher ups, they retained their status, you know, um, unfortunately. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't even a 26 county sort of independence day that James Connolly may have accepted that you could build towards the, the, the republic, the socialist republic. Um, it was nothing like it. For the ordinary people. For the ordinary people. Um, and the question for the both of you would be, uh, to what extent were attacks on nationalists, you mentioned the 1920 uh, pogrom and, and so on, to what extent were they premeditated? You know, rather than being uh, spontaneous, we sometimes look at that as you know, uh, again to accept the colonizers' narrative that uh, you know you just have two groups of people that don't like each other for whatever reason. But very often, uh, as Fergal sort of alluded to, the British state is never very far behind whenever loyalism uh, lashes out. Um, so, could you both sort of give your opinions on that? I'll, I'll uh, have, have a go at it anyway. The, 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 you have to understand the Ulster Unionists' leadership's position in terms of what happens in 1920. So the, if you read the correspondence of, of uh, Dawson Bates, uh, and D Dawson Bates is an inveterate bigot, really, you know, and I'm and, and very proud of it. And whenever the, the British government uh, Set up an inquiry in lieu of, of, of a you know public inquiry. They, they, they sent over Talents, who's a British civil servant, and he's damning of Bates and his two secretaries. These people are like cretins. But how are they running government departments? And and Henry Wilson says the same thing. He's made military advisor before two Army men kill him, supposedly in Collins' orders. Uh, get rid of this Dawson Bates man. This man's terrible. And James Craig can't get rid of Dawson Bates. And Carson can't, because he knows all the secrets. He's, 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 uh, Ronald McNeil, the officer stand for Union, says he was a master wire puller in Belfast uh, Old Town Hall, where the, the Ulster Unionist Council was located. So, but he's, always, he's writing to Carson all the time, worried about the rise of working class politics in Belfast, worried about the, the general strike, the 44 hour strike in January 1919, worried about the defection of, of uh, young Protestant males to this terrible Bolshevik socialism. They, they, they believe that Sinn Féin is part of a global Bolshevik conspiracy. They really do. Yeah, the Eamon de Valera. So uh, 
it is. It's the, and this this idea, you know, that crack pipe smoking right wing conspiracy theories are like a new thing, is not true at all. In fact, uh, the union's political leadership engaged in this type of thing. You read the, their internal memos; it's ridiculous. They think that Sinn Féin had organised a policy of buying houses across Ulster's towns and moving people from the south up so that they would outnumber Protestants electorally. You know, they, they already had enough money for guns, never mind houses. But this, in the, in the favourite imagination of the radical right, this is what's going on, and it's, it's, it's still there. But, so what the unionists also, now this doesn't mean that they're not intelligent, they're incredibly intelligent. That's what makes them so dangerous. But, so the also unionist council have to negotiate partition first, and the, 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 the treachery against the other three counties. Uh, Strong, the leader of the Ulster, uh, or the Orange Order, who's a lead, lead member of the Ulster Unionist Council. In fact, every single minister in the Stormont government is a member of the Orange Order. And uh, J.M. Andrews, who's the head of their, the, who's a mill owner and the head of their Labour Association, actually, uh, <laughs> when, when he's a Minister of Finance, launches an inquiry because there's a report that a Catholic's opening the door at Stormont and it, it, because of, of, of complaints. But anyway, so what the, what the Ulster Unionist leadership have to do is they have to negotiate the idea of six and nine county partition. And they have to do that before they attack this emerging working class constituency and the nationalist population in Belfast. So they do that between March and May 1920. And James Craig writes a really uh, very interesting pamphlet. He says that the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant, you know, that was going to sign up this nine county provisional government, he says it was not a compact for suicide. That's what he says. It's not a compact for suicide. The six counties is a citadel of unionism. Are we going to suffer, you know, for the sake of the people on the frontier? And that's what that's what he says. And he he he, he shoves them over. So whenever they get through under a, a right bus recently by the Tory government, perhaps you know it's 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 uh, chickens coming home to roost. But what they then do is, and this is very very clear. And if you read the minutes of the Ulster Unionist Labour Association, you need to be very. There's an idea within historiography that it's the Ulster Protestant Association and the, uh, the British Empire Union. By the way, the British Empire Union, Carson is the vice chairman of it as well. These, these are all, pro like, if you read the historiography of this and you look at their literature, you'll see that these are all proto-fascist organisations, really. And the Ulster uh, ex Servicemen's Association, which is really, really telling, uh, the fact from the comrades of the, of the Great War, because there's too many Catholics in Belfast, who, who joined the Colours. In fact, Catholics in Belfast were four times more likely to join the British Army than Catholics anywhere else in Ireland. So these homes fit for heroes and these loyalty tests don't include Catholics who went and fought and died in the, in the First World War. But what, what the Ulster Unionist Labour Association does, and, and, and it's, it's controlled by Dawson Bates, is that it, it, it organises it organises the expulsions. This is very, very clear that there are negotiations. Carson meets them before his speech at Finnehy. Okay? The Ulster Protestant Association put up the leaflets, but there's a subsequent disciplinary meeting about one member of the Ulster Unionist Labour Association who didn't behave himself at the meeting uh, in Workman and Clark's when they say, they said the day, he said something like the days of the orange drum was over and, you know, and because of this, they took disciplinary proceedings against them. Now what they, so they organised the, the expulsions and then the Labour, the Belfast Labour Party councillors uh, and, and Sinn Féin and the Nationalists, they put a motion to Belfast City Hall to oppose or to condemn the expulsions. And the, 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 especially the young apprentices, the young apprentices in these skilled you know, craft unions, the Sars, Dr. Lewis Labour, they crowd the City Hall with flags and banners, they fire revolvers and they attack the non-unionist councillors. So the, the, the idea that, you know, this is just some sort of spontaneous expression of loyalist, you know, uh, exasperation with this murder campaign in the South is nonsense. This is part of a deliberate campaign to purge the labour market of opposition forces to make any sort of economic, you know, existence in the North reliant on loyalty. Loy you know, it, 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 you... you a very, very intelligent analysis recently called it the moral economy of, loy of loyalty. It's that in order to survive in the North, in order to have a job in one of the, you know, Osbeth calls Belfast a, 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 a superior Manchester. We, we'll say maybe 10 years later that wasn't true. And this is, this is another, and I'm rambling here, but this is another very strange thing about the whole idea of partition. So one of the central arguments of the unionists was that somehow 
a work ethic and Protestant identity were equivalent to industrial prosperity. But off, by, by, by 1920, and by 19, particularly by, by 1921, you know, you, you're talking over 25% unemployment across the six counties. The shipbuilding industry is dying, the linen industry is dying, there's no more war contracts. That pre-war, you know, consumer-driven boom in 1990, into the, into the spring of 1920, is gone. The, the northern economy is dying on its ass, and it's in that environment then that the, the, this precariat, both Catholic and Protestant, exists. So what do you do? You exclude the Catholics, you make employment consequent on loyalty, and then the British state comes in with six million pounds and gives you money in a part-time paramilitary police force. So th that's, that, that's what it's about. That's what, what the creation of the North was. And it suited the imperial interests of an elite in 1920. Now, we're, we're getting to a stage where, you know, the, the British political elite are quite keen on empire at the minute. But the, this idea that somehow, you know, Britain was trying to chart a course between, you know, these two warring tribes is absolutely ridiculous. The, this, the, the, the entity of the six counties was based on, a, you know, a, a, what George Rude would call a derived imperial consciousness, which met a very, very, very forceful colonial settler mentality that was linked to material conditions. So the Belfast Labour Party were making hay, hay with unskilled workers, with Protestant women, people like Dawson, Gordon. They were prepared to abandon unionism. But the, the craft unions based, the FEST and, and the shipyard workers and the engineers, they were the, sto they were the stormtroopers of Ulster loyalism. You know, John, Mc John uh, McKay, who's a leading member of the Ulster Unionist Labour Association, he's a councillor in uh, Bangor, he, he gives a speech after the expulsions and he calls the shipyard workers the black and tans of industry. He calls them the imperial guard, the black and tans of industry. So, like, you know, uh, was it deliberate? I think perhaps it may have been. And just to follow on that, like literally that, that whole week after Edward Carson makes that speech saying that, you know, we will defend ourselves, we will, you know, use violence. And the, the letters being sent into the newspapers from people and it's getting more, you know, the, the speech is, is more violent as the letters go on. And it's day after day after day and you knew something was going to happen. Something definitely was going to happen, what was going to trigger it. Um, it just so happened to be then that you have the funeral of Bryce Ferguson Smith. It's in, it just ties in nicely with that. He's from Banbridge and then they're all going back to work after the 12th holidays. Um, it just all comes together. But I do certainly agree with Fergal. Like if you see those letters from the ordinary unionists coming in, they were going to do something. They were going to use violence. But then what, what hap like when it spreads to the communities then, um, at that moment in time, is, is elements of a premeditated possibly, I would say later on, when we go into 21 and 22, definitely premeditated. But um, I'd say a lot of it then in the local communities or the localities would be reactionary to what was coming at them, you know, with the likes of Bally McGarrett and so on, um, where the, the, the people just had to defend themselves against attack. And um, we, we can talk about the uh, different class uh, divisions relating to the, to the partition of Ireland, to the, also to the, the treaty negotiations and the, the split in, within the Republican movement and everything. Um, there definitely is a substantial body of evidence that there was a class and a, a social and economic split um, within the Republican movement itself. Uh, relating to the treaty, not necessarily because of partition, even though we can say with the benefit of hindsight that partition was probably the most uh, enduring legacy of uh, the, the infamous uh, treaty. Um, Liz, you're the author of a book on women and the Irish Revolution. Uh, what was the attitude coming them on as the, the women's republican movement was uh, very much opposed to the treaty itself. How, how did they see, how did the women's movement see the, um, the, not just the partition of Ireland, but I suppose you could say partition as, as part of a, a broader undoing of the gains of the Irish Revolution? 
Well, the, the women um, were the force to actually hold their conference, their convention. Um, on whether they as an organisation should accept or reject a treaty. That happened in February 1922. Um, Candace Markovic, I think, did state that, you know, there should have been a woman delegate at the treaty negotiations. There, there, there should have been, you know, a, a woman representative. Um, because the women had done a lot more in, you know, the War of Independence and so on, you know, they weren't just, you know, they didn't just treat wounds and, you know, carry dispatches. The women were well able and they had political know-how as well um, and were great organisers. But you don't have that representation of the women as part of the treaty, uh, the Irish plenipotentiaries. Um, so when the treaty was brought back, and I would say very few people talk about partition in the treaty debates. Um, oh, uh, not Sean, is it Sean Etchingham? Sean McEntee. He's one of the few that talks about the North. Um, and because he had that insight, um, he had that knowledge, he knew. Um, but you look at the treaty debates, there, there are very few people talk about, about partition because it had come into effect with the Government of Ireland Act. I suppose the treaty cemented that partition. But the women in February 1922 come and on hold a convention in the Mansion House. They overwhelmingly reject the treaty. Like it's, I think it's 63 voted for it against 457 against it. So come and on said lo, said no very very loudly. That was followed in March by the IRA convention. Um, but the women were seen as um, to be making emotional speeches and um, you know to. to to be hysterical and so on. But you look at some of the speeches the men made, and Dev and Griffith, they were just as hysterical and emotional as the women. You know, the difference was the women were on the ground and the women were politically active. You look, if you look at certain women, look at Countess Markovic, you look at Kathleen Clark, you look at Maud Gawne, even though she was on the periphery at that stage, Helena Maloney, all these women who went down to treaty, they were the members of Nina Naharan, who have been politically active since 1900, who I would argue were the reason you had Nafina Aaron and the volunteers and coming them on, who would, be, would have as close a vision to the, the Ireland that James Connolly wanted, because these women were working on the ground, seeing what life was like for the ordinary people. They were trying to improve life for the ordinary people. And they saw that this was not going to benefit the majority of people. Um, and who are the first ones then to be cast um, aside and blamed when the civil war is over? The women. They were actually, it was, they were blamed for causing the civil war. And then who are the ones that suffer in the new Irish state? The women and the working class. Because you've got the likes of W.C. Cosgrave, who was from pretty much just outside of Liberties, lived opposite the South Dublin Union. He witnessed the, 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 the effects of poverty. And he was quite happy. What was it he wanted to transport people, the poor people out of this country? That's what he was saying about his own. And he's from that area. So that's what we were up against. That's what the women were up against. Um, and then I know, and I'll just go on a little bit more of a rant, and it's, it's sort of getting off the, the, the topic completely, but Eamon de Valera gets the, the blame for putting women back into the home. You know, this whole image of what an Irish woman should be. But it starts with Kevin O'Higgins and W.T. Cosgrave and their dislike of what Irish women should be and the working classes. Sorry, rant over. Not at all. It's a very important point, I think, to look at it that the two uh, sections of the Republican movement that were most opposed to the treaty, uh, namely, as you mentioned, the FINA, as the, the, the youth wing and uh, coming them on, you know, youth and uh, women were among the most uh, pressed sections of Irish society in the new free state. And I don't think that's a, that's a coincidence either. Uh, there's lessons to be drawn there. Um, you also mentioned the, the working class. I think even not too long after the uh, partition of Ireland in the end of the, call it civil war, but really it was the, the counter-revolutionary war um, that you had, for example, a, a strike of post workers and so on. So, Again, it, it kind of shows how partition, really the free state that took over 
was a uh, little different from the British. It kind of brings to mind Connolly's uh, classic quote about raising the green flag over Dublin Castle, but if you don't change the, the system and so on. Um, kind of going back to you, Fergal, could you talk a bit about kind of what we were talking about there? What was the place of the Irish capitalist class, uh, not just in the treaty and negotiations, but how did they relate to partition? Did a certain section of Irish capitalism uh, benefit from partition? Yeah, the, 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 there's an odd great quote from Connolly about the, the green coated, uh, the, uh, the green coated soldier, uh, uh, you know, beating down the, the thin hand of the poor. And, and, and the, again, that that's key. And you, what you notice in all, uh, you have to try and understand this period as, as as an organic crisis, as a global systemic crisis that begins with the the, the first world war, but but because of internal contradictions in, in an over expanding imperial capitalism, really, and that what happens in the free state, and, and again without like I don't want to have like a sort of reductionist paint by numbers class analysis here, but what you what you see in in the free state is the reconstitution and reemergence of what I talked about earlier on. In the North, you get that reactionary tendency, and in the free state, you get that liberal constitutional nationalist remedy tendency, which in very many respects accepts the premises of the, the reactionary or the colonial framework. So you have W. T. Cosgrave and Kevin O'Higgins running about in their top hats and their tails and their wee dicky bows going over and eating with the king, and, and having very little, and Patrick McGilligan and other Clondloys alumni saying, you know, it, it's not the, the government's responsibility to, to stop people and starving in Ireland. It's basically get on the kettle boat. And, and any sort of opposition to this is presented as a form of neurosis. So the, 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 the women who speak in the doll debates against the, the, the treaty are, are all, they're called hags. They're called historical hags. And, and, and he says, and O'Higgins says the same thing about social radicals and people who want to promote the social revolution. He says, there's a wee bit of revolutionary idealism, but really it's neurosis and megalomania. He calls it neurosis and megalomania. And he says it's, it's a form of national hysteria. That's what he said. He, he describes the democratic program as mostly poetry. Yeah. And, and the democratic program of the first doll that was voted on, voted on in January and, and June 1920. And, and, and he, they reflect an awful lot of the racist assumptions about ordinary Irish people that the British had. So, so O'Higgins talks about a wantonness, a waywardness and a destructiveness that are the traditional attitude of the Irish people. That's Kevin O'Higgins. Now, what, what are the, what's the framework of this? The framework of this is that Griffith is over in London. Griffith is, uh, uh, wants to create an Irish capitalist class. Griffith opposes uh, the workers and the Irish Transport General's Workers' Union uh, during the lockout. And if you look at that alignment of class forces in 1913, and then you look at the alignment of class forces in 1922, you will see incredible similarities. You will see Griffith lined up on one side and W.T. Cosgrave, you know, Sinn Féinor, or Michael Collins called him the bloody little altar boy. And uh, you'll see Kevin O'Higgins. Who is Kevin O'Higgins? Kevin O'Higgins is related to Tim Healy. Tim Healy is the political leader of a Healy tendency of the All for Iron League with William O'Brien, who were in the pocket of whom? William Martin Murphy. So the same forces that lined up against Larkin and the working class in 1913 are the same forces that reaped the harvest of the counter-revolution in 1922. That is, the Catholic Church, the indigenous big capitalists, okay, right-wing populist nationalists, sectarians, so Sinn Féin, all for Iron League, Kevin O'Higgins, and, you know, Kevin O'Higgins was very good at moralising when he wasn't laying on top of his lavery. But, uh, you know, this idea and this, this sort of new consensus is not a new consensus at all. It's just the shawning class re-emergent. And if you look at your current political masters in the 26 counties, they're doing a good impersonation of Redmondism. They, they, just the global, global hegemon has changed, but they still do due, due, due diligence to imperialism. And again, this is, this is where we're at. And one of the big things about, and there were no, clearly no women were going to be represented in the treaty negotiations, but there were no Labour people represented either. Because Labour essentially abrogated this responsibility by abstaining. Paul O'Donnell says that at the Manchin House Conference when Sinn Féin are established in October 1917, nobody noticed that the chair of the colony had won for the Labour movement in 1916 was left empty. And then you get, you get that you, 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 there's an awful lot of, you can combine or condemn Thomas Johnson and William O'Brien for their rhetorical militancy, this kind of talk left and walk right. But what yeah, happened in Ireland in this period, and it's very, very clear, is that you know, there were tens if not hundreds of thousands of Irish people, men and women, 
intent on creating the Workers' Republic or the Cooperative Commonwealth. Yeah, there were 200 strikes a year from 1918 right up to 1920. In 1923, a quarter of the entire number of strikes and, and working days lost in Great Britain were in Ireland. James Connolly comes back from Sing Sing prison and say what you like about his mentality and his state of mind. He launches you know, the dying kick of a social revolution that was never fulfilled. Well, the programme for that social revolution was voted on twice, and it's the democratic programme of the first all. So women, poor people, young people, these are the people who are excluded, and the, and the people who, who kind of uh, fulfilled Con Connolly's dire prophecy about the current of a reaction on both sides of the border, the, you know, the stop the, the progress of, of democratic labour uh, for a generation. It actually was for more than a generation. It's been for 100 years. But now, it's, what, what essentially happens in history is that, you know, uh, there's, there's revolutionary change, and the scope for revolutionary change are not constants. Right? Marx's old mole spends an awful lot of time underground, and, so, and he's, he's popped his head up now. And we have an opportunity, but we need to kind of reflect on, well, you know, a hundred years ago, an awful lot of the similar forces and opportunities were there. But unless you have a popular movement in Ireland of Catholic, Protestant and the centre intent on establishing a 21st century version of what the majority of people voted for hundred years ago, which was a democratic program and a, a, and a republic based on social justice, then, you know, we, we, we could be, our successors in a hundred years could be going, what happened to them ages a hundred years ago that they, you know, they didn't learn the, the lessons of history? So it, 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 to answer your question, which I haven't did yet, is that, uh, no, it, the, the, the demarcations and the alignments and the configuration of the counter-revolution and the capitalist class are there, they're at the table in the treaty negotiations. It's cutting a deal between indigenous capital and the, the, and the imperial master in Westminster. And, that, and that, they, they are the forces who, who institute the, the counter-revolution. I should also say that partition isn't an issue in the Dáil debates because they foolishly all think that it's not going to last. Yeah? And, and at the same time that they're debating, uh, I was going to say they're, they're all master debaters in the, the Dáil, but we'll, we'll, we'll not go there. The, the same time that they're debating the treaty in the Dáil, Michael Collins is secretly organising a joint IRA offensive against the North. And there's two offensives in March and May 1922. Now, Michael Collins is a key figure in the consolidation of the Free State because he leads enough Republicans into acceptance of the treaty with this promise of freedom to achieve freedom. He's going to write a Republican constitution. He has a coalition pact with Sinn Féin in the May 1922 elections, and he launches a sort of type of sort of secret IRA campaign. It's when he goes over to England with his Republican constitution and he's told where to put it, he comes back home and he cancels the election pact and then he calls off the Northern Offensive. That's when, you know, the, 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 the counter-revolutionary dog begins to bite. Uh, thanks a million, uh, Fergal. You made reference there to the democratic programme and I suppose as a concluding remark we can talk about the uh, democratic programme and a need for it in the 21st century, which is uh, something that the Pat O'Donnell Social Republican Forum has in fact done. Um, Liz, uh, do you want to give us some concluding remarks before we end this evening? I think really crucially we, we can learn from history. Um, I think the ordinary people acknowledge what had happened um, and maybe are willing to learn from it. We just need the people in positions of power to look back and go, yeah, that didn't work. And, you know, look at everyone. Like, there's, there's not just one type of person on this island, there's lots. And we need to be represented. And we're all using the, the, the vision of Connolly in that proclamation, you know, the, the, the forestry with Irish men and Irish women. You know, we all live in an island called Ireland at the end of the day. And, you know, religion shouldn't come into it. And if you bring it down to the basics, the working class, whether you're Catholic, Protestant, whatever, your issues are as important to you. They're the same issues as me, whether I'm Catholic or Protestant. And, and why shouldn't we have those opportunities? Why shouldn't our kids have those opportunities? Why are we still fighting for housing, education, basic rights? Um, and, you know, really politicians should step up to the mark and just come on, deliver. Just do it, deliver. 
That's uh, it. Thanks a million. Sorry. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> you're grand. We'll uh, bring it bring it to an end there. So for this evening, and uh, thanks for everybody for tuning in. And uh, once again, uh, this event has been co-sponsored by the Paradon Social Republican Forum in the New Theatre in uh, Dublin uh, as part of the James Connolly Festival. So uh, thank you again. <laughs>